So there's a lot of discussion about the issues affecting honeybees and with good reason. They're currently the workforce of our modern agricultural system and they're shipped and ferried all across the country to pollinate everything from uh, lemons to almonds. But equally troubling is the habitat loss, climate change, disease and pesticide affecting the 4,000 plus native bees here in the United States. So how can we help? Well, one, we can plant native plants for our area. And number two, we can build a bee house. We'll cut some wood, char it, stick a roof on it, drill some holes and hang it up. And I'll show you why I'm using paper straws to do it. And it'll be the bee's knees. Sorry. <laughs> So you may be surprised to know that honeybees are not native to North America. They were brought over by settlers probably in the 1600s or so. But our native solitary bees have evolved here for millions of years. So they're really specialized pollinators. And most are uh, better at pollinating than honeybees. And so when we look around the world, native solitary bees are estimated to uh, pollinate up to 80% of all flowering plants. So they're an important part of our ecosystem. One of the best ways that we can help them is to plant native plants for our area. And the other way is to build a bee house. So uh, a bee house is not where a bee will live, but it's where they'll nest and lay their eggs. And so it's estimated about 70% of all uh, native bees uh, actually build their nests in the ground and then the other 30 percent are building their nests in cavities such as hollow stems or holes in wood and then part of that 30 percent are those cavity nesting bees that will actually take over the nests of other cavity nesting bees and so our bee house is going to provide those ready-made cavities for the bees to move in and we're likely to see uh, bees uh, such as mason bees or leaf cutter bees the female bees will create nesting chambers by building walls using either mud, leaves, or another material. And each nesting cell contains a lump of pollen and an egg. The larva then hatches, looking all grub-like, and begins eating the pollen. The larva continues eating and getting bigger and bigger. And then it'll spin a tough, silky dark cocoon, often covered in its own poop. Hey, it happens. The larva then molts within the cocoon into a white pupa and looks like an adult bee, except it's all white. Then after a long winter, the fully formed bee leaves the nest once spring temperatures get warm enough. So this is my bee nest from last year. It's full of little bees and once the spring temperatures get warm enough, they'll hatch and then they'll start the next generation. There's many types of native bees here in the upper Midwest, and we're likely to see two main types, such as the mason bee and the leafcutter bee. The mason bee flies from early spring to early summer, uh, and most construct cells with mud or leaf pulp, and the adults are dark and bulky, often with a pretty metallic blue sheen, and they're fast. The small mason bee flies from mid-spring to early summer. Their nests are also made out of leaf pulp or mud, and the adults look like regular mason bees, but more slender, and usually without any metallic sheen. The leaf cutter bee flies all summer, and you guessed it, most use cut leaf fragments to build fully enclosed cells. The adults are dull black with white, yellow, orange, or black hair, often forming stripes. We may also see the resin bee, which flies all summer. With just 11 types in all of North America, they use plant resin to construct cells. They're small black bees with short white hair. The yellow-faced bees fly all summer, and they're unique because they make their nests without any foreign materials. Instead, they make cells out of a clear film that they secrete from glands on their bodies, and it almost looks like cellophane. The adults are tiny, hairless, and glossy black with yellow markings on their head, obviously. The carter bees fly all summer. They collect hairs off of certain fuzzy plant leaves and make a woolly substance to line their nests. And adults are black with yellow markings. So we may also see a uh, native wasp, but because they're predatory, they will stock their individual cells with things like a baker's dozen of aphids, a uh, caterpillar or beetle larva. Mmm. So get this, a female bee can store sperm in a specialized organ that allows her to uh, decide 
the sex of her offspring. And so if she fertilizes the egg, it'll become female. And if she doesn't fertilize the egg, it'll become male. And so when she's laying her eggs, the females will be toward the back of the cavity with a lot more pollen. And then the males will be toward the front of the cavity with uh, less pollen, but also they're more subject to uh, predation such as birds or other insects. And so when it is time to hatch, the males will actually uh, uh, hatch first in the spring or summer. So it makes sense that they're at the front of the cavity and they're also more expendable. So the sex of the bees is largely chosen by the length of the cavity. And so it's recommended that we have about five to six inches of depth for each cavity. And this is a four by six board or essentially a beam. And I wanted to find a four by eight, but of course there's a shortage because of you know what. Um, this is actually uh, three and a half inches by five and a half inches. And so for the international viewers, we do measurements a little different here in the States. So when it's time to drill, I'll drill up to five and one fourth inches. And of course this beam is not treated. We don't want to use treated wood for the health of our bees. This is um, eight foot long. So we need to cut it down to about two feet, which means I should get about four uh, bee houses out of this board. All right, so I'm kind of glad I got a four by six because it was just enough to cut. I'm just finishing the cut with a uh, box saw. So it'll sit on the fence like this, and so I want to give it a roof. And so um, I'm gonna use my angle to mark it and then cut it at 45 degrees. So my next step is to use this one by eight pine board. Uh, I'll cut it down and it'll form a roof on the bee house. It'll also have a little overhang and it'll just make it look nicer. Okay, well, I have that done. I've got my angles. If you're like me, I absolutely hate angles. I hate the miter saw, but these turned out pretty good. Let me show you how it'll look. So that's a nice overhang for the front there. Um, and so we'll glue it and nail it once it's time. But now is the fun part because we get to drill holes into this. Um, and so what I'm using is a drill template. This is like, I don't know, maybe $3 at Ikea. And it's for drawers. But as you can see, there's some nice um, spacing for each one. And so I'm just gonna go down this, mark the holes with a pencil, um, you'll see it doesn't go for the full length, so I'll just flip it, realign the holes, and then do the last two, one or two holes there. And then I'll just continue going down until I'm done, and then I'll be ready to drill. All right, I have all of my holes marked. I don't know if you can see them there. Um, but even though I have all of them marked here, it doesn't mean I'll use all of them, especially for the larger holes wherever I put these. And so now my next, um, once I have all of these drilled, I'm gonna insert paper straws. And these essentially do the same thing for the things that are marketed as Mason B inserts. Uh, but what's with these is that you can get a variety of sizes and they're a lot cheaper than those uh, B inserts, which usually only come in one or two sizes. Uh, the one difference here is that the straws are gonna be longer than the board here. So I will be cutting them down. Again, this is a five and a half inch uh, depth here. It'll sit like this on the fence. And so I'm gonna have to trim these down. I'm only gonna drill to about five and one fourth on this. And so I've already ordered a bunch of different size straws from Amazon, of course. 
and I've done a drill template so I know which size of drill bit to use for each of these straws. And so these are different sizes. Um, this is marketed as a stir. It's about, I believe, five millimeters. This is a drinking straw size, uh, six millimeters. I think this is just a larger drinking straw um, at eight millimeters. And this is marketed as a smoothie straw at about 10 millimeters. So what I've done is I've drilled some different size holes to see which ones fit. So I know I'm gonna need a 1364th drill bit, a 1 4th drill bit, a 3 8 for this uh, larger smoothie straw, and an 11 32nd. So uh, what I did is that I had to order a special uh, size of drill, drill bit uh, so that it would be six inches in length because I know I'm gonna drill about five and one fourth into this. And so my regular drill bits were gonna be too short for that. So it's also important to know that bees, uh, different varieties of the native and solitary bees will prefer different size holes. So we're gonna have a bunch of uh, different varieties of holes on here. Um, I'll probably do them symmetrical just cause I like them that way. Some say you may wanna vary them up so it'll help the uh, female bee find the hole that's hers a lot easier. Um, we'll just see what happens. Okay, well, that took longer than expected. So now I wanna try something that is gonna be a liberal attempt at something called Shoshogi Ban, which is an ancient Japanese uh, technique at charring wood, and it's usually used on cedar. And so the idea is that once you char the outside of the wood, it's uh, gonna be carbon. And so carbon is resistant to uh, the weather to rot and to uh, insects. And so what we're gonna try, we'll see how it works, but the idea is that once it's charred, it's gonna be weatherproof. And because we're using untreated wood, uh, this is probably the best and safest method for our bees. So I want to hang each bee box on my fence post in the back so I just have to carve out a little area for these keyhole hangers so I can hang them up easily. I just have to make a little more room for the screws. And it's important to know that uh, solitary bees uh, do not clean house. So that's why we're using these paper straws. We'll insert them into each hole and then uh, we'll be able to remove them each season. So this spring, the bees will lay their eggs in the bee house and they'll mature all the way through next spring and summer when they finally hatch. At the end of next winter, I'll pull the paper tubes out of the bee house and then put new ones in. And that process will help um, prevent buildup of disease or debris in the house. Now, uh, you may be asking what I do with the paper tubes. Well, I'm, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use a beehive you know this is typically ready for or used for honeybees and I'm going to use that as an emergence box and so what that means is when I pull the paper tubes out of the native bee house I'll put those in the box and then uh, in the next spring or summer 
those uh, native solitary bees will hatch and they'll go back out and start the cycle again. So now that our emergence box is done, I'm going to add my bee house from last year into the box, which means the uh, bees would have laid their eggs last spring. They've been maturing all winter or all summer, all winter, and then come spring and summer this year, they'll hatch. So I'm gonna use, put that box to good use already this year and we'll see what happens. So there is some management to uh, creating a bee house and it's only one part of the equation. It does provide a nesting area for our solitary bees, but we also need to provide native plants so that they can thrive in the area where we're trying to attract them. So uh, see what's native in your area and get planting. <laughs> 